how the universe began, what it's made out of at the very smallest level, how it will come to an end? Yeah, me too. I am desperate for this kind of deep knowledge about our universe. But you might be surprised and a little disappointed to learn how little progress science has made in answering these questions. But that's okay. Science is not a list of facts, it's a process. And the first step in that process is to embrace what we don't know, to explore the things we are ignorant about. Because that's how we reveal new deep knowledge about the universe. That's the recipe for making new, mind-blowing discoveries about our universe. And for me, this passion for exploring the unknown came when I was a kid, and I was learning about the age of explorers. These are folks who literally sailed out into the unknown, hoping to be the first person to walk on a new continent, to discover some new fruit and taste it for the first time. And I thought that was so exciting, to be the only human on Earth to have done something or to know something. I mean, imagine what it was like to be the first human being to ever see the Grand Canyon, right? Wow. Or to ever eat chocolate. That sounds pretty good. Or the first person to ever look at the Grand Canyon while eating chocolate or something, right? <laughs> These are all firsts in human history, and I wanted that experience for myself. But as you learn about the age of explorers, you feel like it's sort of in the past, right? Thanks to Google Earth and satellites, we've seen all the continents, right? There are no more little places, little islands for you to land on and name after your puppy or whatever. That feels like it's done. And all the things science have learned, has learned, you might be forgiven for imagining that science has most of the universe figured out, that the rest is just a few details that we have to sort out. Well, the point I want to make to you today is that the exact opposite is true. I think we're at the beginning of a new age of exploration, a new era of discovery when we're going to learn things about the universe that will positively blow our minds. All right, so what kind of things can we still learn about the universe? Well, I think there are a lot of really big, fat questions that are not answered. And when I say a big, fat question, I mean the kind that you don't have to be a scientist to be interested in the question or to even understand the question. The kind of question where if you knew the answer, it might change the way you felt about life and the whole human condition. For example, here's some favorite big, fat questions, right? If you knew exactly for a fact what happens after we die, it might change the way you lived your life, right? The problem with these questions, though they're wonderful and fascinating, is that they're philosophy questions, which means we can talk about them for hundreds or thousands of years and not necessarily make any progress. And sometimes I wonder if philosophers are more interested in talking about the questions than actually finding answers, which is why this is one of the most common questions or one of the most famous questions in all of philosophy. What is it like to be a bat? Of course, the answer is we'll never know, so they get to keep talking about it. But the thing that's exciting to me is that there are other questions at the same level. Questions like this, how did the universe begin? This is a science question because there is one true answer to this question. There is one way in which the universe began and in no other way. And if you knew the answer to this question, how the universe was created, that could very well change the way you felt about your life and how to live it. But the best part about this question is that we will one day know the answer. Someday, some human being, a hundred, a thousand years from now, will know how the universe was created. And they will look back at us the way we look at primitive man. They will wonder, how is it possible? What was it like to be so ignorant, to not know the answer to this very basic question about our existence, right? So we can't talk about all these questions today, though I'd love to. So let's just focus on one, one very simple question, which is, how is the universe put together? What is it made out of? This is a very reasonable question to want to know the answer to, right? What am I made out of? What are you made out of? What is this whole amazing, crazy universe we find ourselves in? How is it put together? Well, I think it's also <clears throat> an ancient question. It's the kind of question people have been asking since people have been asking questions. Right? All you need to do to be motivated to ask this question is take two rocks, smash them together, and get smaller rocks. And then you can wonder, can I keep doing that? Can I get infinitely small rocks? I literally did this as a kid, so maybe it's not a surprise that I became a particle physicist. And I remember wondering, like, is there some smallest possible rock, or can you keep going forever, or does it turn into something else? So imagine you are a caveman or cavewoman physicist, and you're the first person to ask this question. You get to take the first bite of this big intellectual apple. 
How do you tackle such a huge question? How do you embrace your ignorance and sail into the unknown? Well, in science, we have a very well-worn technique, which is try the dumbest thing first, okay? And in this case, when you don't know how to start, you might think, well, if I want to know what the universe is made out of, maybe I just start by making a list, right? What's in the universe? So your list might look like this, right? Well, I'm in the universe, right? Let's be pedantic. You, uh, it's caveman time, so there's a rock over here, a rock over there. And the more you look, you discover, wow, there's lots of different kind of rocks in the universe, right? <laughs> and the more you look around, the more you're like, wow, the universe is filled with lots of different kinds of things. And this question becomes much more deep, right? It's not just... Well, how am I put together, but what's my relationship with this rock and with that mushroom? Are we all made of the same kinds of things? How do you explain this incredible complexity we find? And the more you look, the more you're amazed at the near infinite variety of stuff. I mean, we have bicycles and iPhones and strangely muscular dudes become governor of California. I mean, it's a weird universe we live in, and you have to explain all of it if you're going to answer this question. And then you have to think, what kind of answer do we want? I mean, if you could speak to an oracle and ask it this question, what is the universe made out of, and it gave you literally a list of everything in the universe, you wouldn't feel like, aha, right? You wouldn't have that moment of understanding because it's not the kind of answer you're looking for. The kind of answer we're looking for is one that reveals some deeper truth, that pulls back a layer of reality and shows us what's going on underneath. Lists don't answer that question. Instead, what we need to do is look for patterns. We organize our knowledge and find patterns, and those patterns lead to questions. And the questions are the clues that will guide us to revealing something new about the universe. So here, for example, we can organize all the stuff we see. We can say all the living stuff goes over here and all the rocks go over there. And, you know, we can argue about which category Arnold belongs in, right? But everything finds a category, and we notice patterns. And those patterns lead us to revealing things about the universe. So fast forward a few hundred years or a few thousand years, if you give the Greeks any credit, I don't think they deserve it. And we've made an incredible accomplishment, which is we've described everything that I'm made of, that you're made of, everything that any human has ever interacted with or tripped over or thrown at each other, all of those things are made out of a few basic building blocks. I'm talking about the 100 elements of the periodic table. It's an incredible achievement. And you might be thinking, hold on, this guy's supposed to be a particle physicist. Why are we learning high school chemistry? Well, because this is one of the most underrated intellectual achievements in human history. If our goal is to explain the almost infinite variety of stuff in the universe, breaking it down to a hundred things, that's most of the work, right? The rest is probably details. Even the fact that it's possible to describe everything, to build everything out of the same basic building blocks, still blows my mind. I mean, why is that even true, right? It's like the universe is organized in the same way that Lego bricks are. Right? A few building blocks, and you can make dinosaurs, or you can make pirates, or you can make dinosaur pirates, or whatever you want. And the critical thing to understand here is a deep truth about the universe is the identity of an object, the thing that makes it what it is, is not due to what it's made out of, but how those pieces are put together. And that is a deep truth about the universe. I mean, it could have been different. If you're a caveman or cavewoman scientist, you might have discovered a universe in which everything is made out of its own different kind of thing, right? Maybe cats are made out of their own little weird cat particles, and that's why they're so strange, right? Who knows? But this is the kind of thing you have to think about if you're totally open-minded to new theories of the universe. All right, but we have discovered that the universe is made out of a few basic building blocks, you know, 100 or so elements of the periodic table. But again, a list of elements is not the answer we're looking for. We want to peel back one more layer. How do we do that? Well, we look for patterns. And of course, there are patterns in the periodic table. It's periodic, after all. Some of these guys are metallic, and some are active, and some are inactive. And the folks who put the periodic table together, they had questions. And those questions were clues that guided their experiments that helped them reveal that all of those structures they saw on the periodic table, all the unanswered questions were hints that showed them the structure of the atom. Because everything in the periodic table just comes out of how those electrons fill their orbitals and how it's all put together. And of course, we've dug deeper. Inside the atom, we have protons and neutrons. And inside those protons and neutrons, we have these funny little particles called quarks up quarks and down quarks, which you put together in different amounts to make either protons or neutrons, which means we've learned something amazing, which just three particles, the up quark and the down quark to make your protons and neutrons, and then sprinkle around some electrons to make any atom, with just these three particles, you can make literally anything you have ever eaten. 
You ask a particle physicist to write a cookbook, right? Every recipe is the same. Electrons, up quarks, and down quarks, okay? And the mind-blowing thing is even the, rate, the relative proportions are identical. That is, a kilogram of like ice cream and a kilogram of lava and a kilogram of hamsters have exactly the same particle content. The only thing that's different is the arrangement. All right, so you might be thinking infinite variety down to 100 basic building blocks, down to three particles. We're basically figuring this thing out, right? We're like around the corner from finding the one particle that rules them all, right? Not true. There are still a lot of open questions. For example, these are not the only particles we found. The two quarks we found are just examples of six other quarks, of six total quarks that we've discovered. The electron is an example of six kind of particles we call leptons. So are these 12 particles we've discovered? But of course, we don't just make a list, right? What we do is we organize our knowledge. And so now we have a new periodic table. This time, it's a periodic table of the fundamental particles. In this first column, we have the up quark and the down quark, and of course, the electron to make normal matter. We also have this weird particle called the neutrino. Not weird because it's rare. In fact, there's 100 billion neutrinos passing through my fingernail every second. Wow. Why am I not like beat down by the neutrino radiation? Because they mostly ignore me, like I ignore them, right? Like you ignore people passing on the street you don't want to talk to. So those are the four basic kinds of particles. The amazing thing is that we've discovered the other eight are not their own kind of particles. They're just copies of the first four, which is why we put them in these two columns. So for example, the charm quark is exactly the same as the up quark, it's just heavier. The top quark is even heavier than the charm and the up, but it's otherwise identical. It's really strange. We notice all these patterns that we do not understand. Just like when we were looking at the periodic table and we noticed all those patterns we had not yet understood. So these patterns lead to questions like, why do we have all these particles? We only need three to make everything we've ever eaten. Why are there 12? Are there only 12? Are there 12,000, 12 billion? We don't know the answer to that question. We don't know if this is the tip of the iceberg or the whole ice cube, right? We don't know why does every particle have two copies. That seems to me like a huge clue that there's something going on underneath, that all these particles are just made out of some smaller thing, and all these features are just clues that would point us to what that is, to help us peel back one more layer of reality. Probably all the information you need to make the next great discovery in particle physics is on this slide. And in 100 years, people will look back and think, man, if I was alive in 2019, I would have figured it out. It's so obvious, right? And yes, it's obvious in hindsight, but when you're standing here at the forefront of human ignorance, you don't necessarily know how to proceed, right? But all these questions are really fun and really fun to think about. The problem with explaining what the universe is made out of is that everything we've learned, everything, all the accomplishments we've made, only bear to 5% of the stuff in the universe. All the stars and gas and dust and hamsters and ice cream, all that stuff is just 5% of the stuff in the universe. We've measured this number very, very precisely. We know very accurately that 95% of the stuff in the universe is something we don't know almost anything about. It's an era of precision ignorance when we know very well how little we know about the universe. So you might wonder, how is it possible to know what we don't know? Well, the story there starts with galaxies. You can think of galaxies as sort of huge cosmic merry-go-rounds with ping-pong balls on them. What happens when you spin that merry-go-round? Ping-pong balls fly out, right? Well, why don't stars fly out of the galaxy? Because the galaxy is spinning pretty fast. The answer is gravity. Gravity holds those stars, the ping-pong balls, into the galaxy. So then you can do something interesting. You could say, let's measure how fast the galaxy is rotating, and then let's find out if there's enough gravity to hold it together by counting up all the stars and figuring out their gravity. So they did that, and they discovered, wow, the galaxies are spinning way too fast. There's not nearly enough gravity to hold it together. But it's not throwing stars into intergalactic space all the time, right? So what's holding it together? So we hypothesized some new kind of matter, something in the galaxy that we couldn't see but gave enough gravity to hold it together. So we call this dark matter. Not because we know what it is. Dark means we can't see it. Matter means it gives gravity. So the name sounds cool for grant proposals, but it really just describes what we don't know, right? 
So we know very little about dark matter. We know that it feels gravity. We discovered it or created the idea of it to explain the missing gravity. It doesn't feel any of the other forces we know how to communicate with matter, electromagnetism, the weak or strong nuclear force. We found no other way to interact with dark matter. I mean, everything we've tried, it just ignores us. You know, it's not even on social media. So we have very little understanding of what dark matter is. Is it made out of a particle, many particles? Is there complicated dark matter physics, maybe even dark matter biology? There could even be dark matter life, right, for all we know. There could be dark matter tourists right here in San Francisco. So 5% of the universe is stuff we've understood a little bit about, but we have big questions. 25%, 27% is something we know it's there. We know it's stuff, but we don't really know what it is. What about the other two-thirds of the universe? Well, this is something we call dark energy, which is code for we have no idea what's going on. And this is something we only recently learned we didn't know. And it came from understanding the history and thinking about the future of the universe. So here's a brief history of what's happened so far in the universe. Big explosion at the beginning, right? Stuff flew out, interesting stuff happened, galaxies and cats were made. And then people were wondering, what's going to happen next? Is there enough gravity so that things are going to stop, slow down, and then fall back in to make sort of a big crunch? Or is there not enough gravity so that things will sort of drift out forever, slow down, but never turn around? So they went out to measure it, and the universe said no to option A, the big crunch, no to option B, the heat death and gradual spreading out. It went for secret option C. And I love when the universe goes for secret option C. It's like, silly humans, you had no idea what you were asking. It turns out the universe is not slowing down at all. It's speeding up. Something out there is accelerating the expansion of the universe. It's creating new space between us and other galaxies. And it's doing it faster than light can travel through that space. We have no idea what's doing this. All we have is the observation of the fact that it's happening, right? But because it's happening faster than light can travel, it means that those photons will never reach us. It's like Usain Bolt is running towards you and somebody's laying out new track faster than he can run, which means things are literally disappearing from the night sky and the future of astronomy might be a lot darker than it is today. But I don't mean to run down science. I just want to give you a taste of all the things we don't know about the universe, all the amazing, wonderful questions that we are asking that we hope will lead us to crazy future mind-blowing discoveries. <laughs> and so if you're interested in this, please check out our book in which we talk about all the things that we don't know about the universe. And all of today's wonderful cartoons come from my collaborator, Jorge Cham. Thank you very much.